Welcome, new or old. Uh, it's great to be here with you uh, for this great summit. Um, my principal job today is to set the stage for the wonderful, the great, the talented Denise O'Donnell, who has going to have the privilege and the honor of introducing and announcing the 10 winners of the grant competition that our two agencies put together to help spread community justice across this great land of ours. Um, but before we get to this uh, moment, this big moment, I do want to exert a moment of executive privilege and hog the mic for a couple minutes, Denise. Uh, I promised you I'd be brief, but I lied. Um, <laughs> Because I want to offer just a few thoughts about the current state of play in, in our field. And, and I offer these thoughts from the perspective of someone who's basically devoted his entire professional career to advancing uh, the idea of community justice. So you perhaps have heard the cliche, often uttered by the mayor of this great city, that uh, the Chinese word for crisis also means opportunity. Um, I'm not sure that this is either technically accurate or true, um, but leaving that aside for a moment, I do think it's pretty clear that we're living through a moment of both great crisis and great opportunity when it comes to criminal justice. When we last gathered as a group, uh, the summit in, in 2014, the storm clouds were still coming together. Since that time, almost every week has brought grim news about the state of criminal justice in our country. Unwarranted uses of force, fees and fines being used to balance municipal budgets, dire statistics about mass incarceration, protests in the streets. Alongside these developments, we've also seen drip by drip by drip the continued erosion of public trust and justice, particularly in low-income neighborhoods and among communities in color. So I would argue that the sense of crisis is very real, but I would also argue that the sense of opportunity is equally real. In New York City, uh, where I, which I call home, the idea of shutting down Rikers Island, shutting down Rikers Island, is actually being discussed not just by advocacy groups, but by those with the power to make it happen. Um, all across the country, thanks in no small part to the MacArthur Foundation here in Chicago, local uh, cities are moving to shrink their local jail populations. President Obama, of course, has helped to advance the national conversation by visiting a federal prison, first president ever to do that, and convening a national task force to ask what should policing look like in the 21st century. Dozens and dozens of criminal justice agencies around the US have answered the call to get smarter and better and more effective, many of them with a helping hand from Denise and Kristen and Kim and Betsy and the smart suite of grant programs at BJA. So there's a lot of change in the air, a lot of good things, I would argue. The question for those of us who have gathered here today um, is simple. How does community justice fit into this new world order? What can community courts and the other types of programs that we'll be focusing on over the next couple of days do to advance the cause of justice reform right now uh, in this country and beyond? So I would argue that embedded within community justice are four ideas that are absolutely essential to the current moment. These are four ideas that if we succeed in spreading them broadly have the potential, potential to utterly transform the justice system, making it not just more effective but more humane. So here, my, here goes my four ideas. So the first thing that community courts can contribute, and indeed have been contributing for years, is to make real the promise of a system that does not mechanistically default to incarceration as the primary response to minor offending. It is difficult to overstate the importance of offering meaningful community-based alternatives to jail at a time when the whole world is watching to see how the United States will address the problem of mass incarceration and asking if it is possible to do so without rolling back the public safety gains of the past 20 years. So the value of jail alternatives was highlighted for me most powerfully, uh, I mean, I think about it all the time, but it was really highlighted most powerfully to me a couple of months ago when I took a few foundation executives to tour the, the great Midtown Community Court in Manhattan. And I encourage you guys to check out Deep Shaw, who's Midtown's director, who's here with us uh, for the summit. Um, Deepal, uh, as part of this visit, we met a defendant named Daniel. So Daniel was in many ways a typical community court defendant. He was not a criminal mastermind, but he was someone with a very long rap sheet, and he was someone with very serious problems, including a long history of addiction. In the course of our conversation, Daniel said that he was certain that if it wasn't for the Midtown Community Court, he would be dead. 
So at the risk of revealing how heartless I am, when people usually make rhetorical gestures like that, I usually pay no attention to them. It kind of doesn't, doesn't move me. But for whatever reason, Daniel stopped me cold. And this might have been because of the way Daniel spoke in an incredibly earnest, heartfelt way, or it might have been the fact that he had a facial scar that went along his entire face, which to me spoke to a life uh, lived close to the edge. So um, Daniel's case was a powerful reminder to me of the importance of the work that is being done on the ground every day by case managers, community service supervisors, and social workers, not just at the Midtown Community Court, but in community justice programs around the world. How do they do that? How do they, how do they literally save lives? According to Daniel, the answer is love. The answer is love. He talked about his relationship with his case manager, Amanda, and the care and attention she had shown him, even when he had relapsed or had difficulty showing up for court appearances. He also talked about the importance of small gestures, in his case, the simple purchase of a meal from McDonald's was a sign of respect, a respect that he has attempted to reciprocate by meeting his obligations to the court, including participation in treatment and parenting classes. So Daniel's story for me highlights a simple truth. It is impossible to improve public safety without changing the behavior of chronic offenders. And our experience at the Center for Court Innovation has been that the best way to change behavior is to create caring reciprocal relationships. Daniel's example gives me hope that with the right combination of programming, accountability, and yes, love, even seemingly hopeless life trajectories can be altered for the good. That is the business of community justice. But community justice isn't just focused on providing defendants with the opportunity and support they need to get back on track. It is also about trying to re-engineer the relationship between the justice system and local neighborhoods, particularly in places with low levels of trust in government. Now, experience tells us that safe neighborhoods, whether rich, poor, or in between, don't operate like police states with officers lurking on every corner. As Jane Jacobs described a long time ago in this great book, you all should read it if you haven't already, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, neighborhood safety must be co-produced by the justice system and local residents. Indeed, our sense of safety often depends upon the willingness of neighbors to work together to get things done and promote positive common values. I would argue that as currently constructed, the criminal justice system does precious little to encourage such things in high crime neighborhoods. Indeed, a great deal of conventional practice, over aggressive enforcement and the misuse of incarceration in particular, tends to undermine the very elements that are crucial to healthy neighborhoods. So that's the bad news. The good news is that community justice can be an important part of hitting the reset button. When they are functioning at their best, community justice programs can actually help activate a neighborhood's capacity to help produce safety for itself. And this brings me to the next two ideas that I think community justice embodies, community engagement and crime prevention. Rather than just reacting after crime occurs, community courts in particular actively seek to engage local residents to reclaim public spaces and to improve the local quality of life. We see this in Spokane, Washington, where court is being held in a downtown library to provide for community access to justice. We see it in the great Dallas, Texas, where citizen action teams are identifying community problems and brainstorming solutions in concert with government agencies. And we see it in Hartford, Connecticut, yes, Chris, where defendants are learning to grow vegetables in a community garden side by side with other residents, all for the benefit of a local food bank. For too long, community engagement and crime prevention efforts like these have been dismissed as mere window dressing. But in truth, these are more than exercises in feel-good justice. They are crucial crime-fighting strategies, capable of improving the efficacy and resilience of entire communities. But we know that it's not enough just to do good works. Perceptions matter too. Part of the secret to the success of the community justice initiatives in places like Harlem, I see you, Chris Watler, in Newark, and in other places, is that they've improved communication with defendants, victims, and the general public. Some people would call this simple common sense. After all, it is hard to comply with a court order if you don't understand what's in it. Those of you who are more academically inclined will recognize this idea as the kernel of procedural justice. This is the fourth essential contribution that community justice has to make to justice reform today. In fairness, the concept of procedural justice is not a new one. Tom Tyler wrote Why People Obey the Law, another book that I recommend quite highly, more than 25 years ago. 
but community courts in particular have helped to breathe life into Tyler's theory, bringing procedural justice out of the dusty pages of academic journals and into the daily practice of judges, attorneys, probation officers, and others. Community courts have demonstrated that by treating individual defendants with dignity and respect, it is possible to simultaneously improve the legitimacy of the justice system and to promote law-abiding behavior. This is no small accomplishment. <coughs> So at the risk of dating myself, I got my start in criminal justice not long after Tyler wrote uh, Why People Obey the Law. Uh, as you heard from Julius, in the early 1990s, I moved to, to New York to help uh, work on community courts first in Midtown and then in Red Hook, Brooklyn. I made this choice then, and I continue to make this choice, and I've continued to make this choice ever since, because I believe that reforming the justice system is both an art and a science. So make no mistake, to do this right, we need to be nerds. Um, we need to be clear thinkers who look at the data and consult the latest social science, particularly when it comes to risk and need assessments. But we also need to be guided by compassion and remember that the justice system isn't an abstract process or a series of numbers on a page. It's a collection of people. And no matter what role they have been assigned in this particular drama, be they police officers or perpetrators, concerned citizens or community corrections officials, all of these actors are driven by the same motivations and idiosyncrasies that always drive human behavior. We can never hope to improve the justice system unless we wrestle with this messy reality. You know, a couple years ago, the National Center for State Courts conducted an independent evaluation of the community court in Red Hook. Uh, another book that I recommend. Maybe that's the, if you're going to read any of these books, read this, this one first. Uh, so this evaluation contains several hundred pages of data and analysis. But my favorite line in the entire report comes from a defendant who had been to the regular criminal court in Brooklyn many, many times uh, before appearing in front of Judge Alex Calabrese in Red Hook. When the researchers asked him about his experience, the defendant said this. This is a quote. I don't get the feeling that Calabrese is one of those judges that looks down on people. To me, he's fair, I'll put it that way. The court officers treat you like a person too, not like that other court over there. I learned that there's two different types of ways that courts treat people. You have these obnoxious goons, and then you have those that look at you like, okay, you made a mistake. So I love that line, they treat you like a person. At their essence, that's what community courts are trying to do. And the way they do this is through the four elements that I've talked about here today. Jail reduction, procedural justice, community engagement, crime prevention. In the process, community courts are offering up a vision of what a more perfect justice system could look like. Now it is up to all of us in the room here today to figure out how to, how to get the rest of the criminal justice system to act and behave and think more like the community courts. That's what this gathering is all about at some level. So, I do want to pause here to acknowledge, as Julius did, the people who organized this conference. I want to thank uh, the entire technical assistance and community justice team at the Center for Court Innovation for their hard work in pulling off this complicated event. I do want to particularly single out my friend Julius Lang, uh, whose energy and belief uh, and enthusiasm and vision has been so important to sustaining the community court movement over many years. I think I'm the only one that gets, is allowed to compliment you. You have, to, you, you, have to, you have to compliment everybody else. Uh, okay, so enough from me. Uh, I want to get to the main event now. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Denise O'Donnell. Uh, as the director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, Denise oversees a portfolio of thousands of grants and billions of dollars. Uh, you all know about that. Uh, that's not what makes Denise important in my estimation. What makes Denise important is that because no matter where she has gone or what role she's, pl she's played, whether it's BJA or U.S. Attorney or Deputy Secretary for Public Safety in New York State, she has always sought to use her powers for good, to poke and prod and push the justice system to be the best that it can be. We are really lucky to have her fighting the good fight on our behalf in Washington, D.C. So please join me in welcoming the great Denise O'Donnell. 